Hey everybody, I'm Natasha Kierchuk and thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program One on One with Alan Dershowitz. The show where we give you, our viewers, a chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He's a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Professor Dershowitz, as always, thanks for joining us. Thank you, and again, mazel tov on your recent uh, beautiful wedding. Yeah, well, still reeling from the excitement, but uh, that's for another discussion. Let's, let's begin with the story that's actually dominating the world news. It's, of course, the recent summit in Singapore between U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un. Trump seems to think the meeting went well, but let's hear directly from him. Chairman Kim and I just signed a joint statement in which he reaffirmed his unwavering commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. We also agreed to vigorous negotiations to implement the agreement as soon as possible. So, Professor Dershowitz, what is your take on these developments? What are the implications for America, the world, and obviously, um, how is this going to affect our region in particular here in Israel? Well, I think, first of all, as President Trump has said, he's not going to rely on paper promises. Uh, President Clinton relied on paper promises. President Bush relied on paper promises. They were broken, uh, and uh, one has to see action on the ground, as my grandmother would put it, tachlis. We have to see real, real action on the ground, make sure that there's really denuclearization and that the uh, negotiation succeeds. Uh, the same thing, of course, is true with Iran. Uh, parchment promises won't do. Uh, uh, paper promises won't do. Deals, uh, uh, the words of deals don't carry a lot of weight with tyrannical regimes like North Korea and Iran. And so we'll have to look to see whether uh, there is real action. Uh, look, President Trump has his own style. Uh, he has been a negotiator for many, many years, and he has achieved success in the business world. I have an open mind as to whether his tactic will succeed in this uh, much more difficult world. I hope it does, and I hope it sends a powerful lesson to uh, Iran that denuclearization of Iran would also uh, have an enormous amount of benefit for the Iranian uh, people. It would eliminate the American sanctions. It would permit the countries to establish somewhat closer uh, relations. Uh, Iran, of course, is an evil uh, regime, not only because of its nuclear ambition, and it indeed has nuclear weapon ambition, but because of its hegemonic interests in the entire Middle East, including the Gulf states and uh, other areas, uh, and its uh, willingness to build a Shia crescent from Iran through Iraq, through Syria, uh, through Lebanon, and even to the Sunni uh, areas of uh, Hamas. So it's very important that their exportation of terrorism stop as well. And I hope that President Trump takes on the Iranian situation uh, vigorously next. Um, I think the deal that was made by the Obama administration was a green light to uh, establishing nuclear uh, weaponry in Iran after uh, eight or 10 years, which is the blink of an eye. And I think there has to be no sunset provision and absolute assurances that Iran will never, under any circumstances, seek to acquire or develop nuclear weapons, as it said it would not, in the prologue to the deal itself. So open mind, let's wait and see. Good first step. Can you make any predictions as to how you think Iran um, will end up reacting to, to this conversation, this meeting, this you know, so-called denuclearization of North Korea? Well, I think it probably um, is, is can, taking it under consideration. Uh, I think the only way Iran will end its nuclear ambitions, if it it's told in unequivocal terms by the Americans, the Israelis, and hopefully the international community, that's probably hoping for too much, that it will never, under any circumstances, be allowed to acquire a nuclear arsenal. If it really believes that that's true and that, in the end, military force, if it has to be used, will be used to prevent the nuclear weaponization of Iran, if it becomes convinced of that, then it will give up its program and try to end the sanctions and develop a, a stronger uh, economic base. But if it still thinks that the world will allow it to develop nuclear weapons in eight or 10 years, then there's no reason for it to give up that ambition because that will help it control the entire Middle East. And 
what we're seeing now is the Middle East uh, ambitions of two non-Arab countries trying to control the entire Arab world, and that is uh, Turkey and Iran. Uh, Iran is a truly villainous uh, country, and Turkey is moving toward the Iran model uh, quickly, uh, though it's a member of NATO, but not a particularly uh, good member of NATO. And so I think Israel has uh, deep concerns, uh, concerns that transcend the Israel-Palestine conflict, but that also focus on the two non-Arab Muslim superpowers in the region. Well, you know, we're going to also discuss the relations between the Iranian people and the Israeli people later on in the show. But let's turn to our next topic, uh, still with a focus on the United States. Michael Litwack is a junior at Binghamton University, and he's pre-law, and he has a question for you. Hello, Professor Dershowitz. I'm Michael from New York. I'm a pre-law major, and I'm really interested in the workings of the law and the protection of civil liberties. And it seems like you think that the civil liberties of millions of Americans are jeopardized through the ACLU becoming more political. And I recently read your article on The Hill in which you claim that the ACLU has put the final nail on its own coffin. So is this really true? Or are you just exaggerating a little bit to make a point? Thank you. I wish I were exaggerating. I was on the national board of the ACLU when it really was a civil liberties organization. Now it's become a hard left advocacy group, which is about to support uh, candidates in elections and become overtly partisan. The only issue is whether it's going to be the Sanders wing of the Democratic Party that it supports or the more centrist wing of the Democratic Party. But it's a symptom of a deeper problem a symptom of what's going on on college campuses today where there are very, very few genuine civil libertarians, where conservatives have picked up the mantle of civil liberties because they're the ones that are being uh, censored. Um, and uh, I experienced it myself. I'm, I'm finishing a book now called The Case Against Impeaching uh, Trump, and it's a constitutional analysis. But as a result of me trying to defend the civil liberties of all Americans, including the president, uh, I have been shunned uh, by old friends on Martha's Vineyard who, who have told me that I've crossed the line and they won't any longer speak to me. Uh, people have said they would walk out if I was given a platform to present my constitutional analysis. Uh, and there are all kinds of uh, issues. Uh, you might expect that from young, uh, 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 immature uh, college students who think they know the truth and the truth is only on one side. But from the ACLU and from uh, old friends on Martha's Vineyard in New York, um, it seems to me you can expect much more than that. We're approaching an age where one cannot have serious discussions about controversial issues. It's only screaming and yelling and name calling, and uh, that should disturb everybody. Well, joining us now in the studio is a very special couple. Taylor Amrani and Achia Klein are dedicating their lives to advocating for the state of Israel and the Jewish people. Both served in the Israeli Defense Forces and then met at Al Gov Ambassadors Program at the Herzliya Interdisciplinary Center here in Israel. So, Achia, why don't you start out with telling us a little bit about your personal story? So, uh, let's just you say, my name is Achia Klein. I'm originally from uh, Kfar Etzion, they're in uh, Gush Etzion, small uh, religious kibbutz. Um, so in the army I was in uh, Yalom. Uh, Yalom is a special engineer unit, combat engineer unit. And um, I, I, after, after I, got, I, I, went, I went to officer school and uh, later on I get injured in, in one of our mission to demolish uh, terror tunnel. It's uh, before a protected age. Um, after I get injured, I, uh, my life is changed a little bit because mm -hmm. I lost my eyesight. And then I decided that I want to do more advocacy um, to talk about Israel. And uh, I do it in, in, in a few, in a few, uh, in a few way. Um, Today I compete with the Israeli Paralympic rowing team, so wow. to, to uh, meet a lot of uh, crew with uh, a lot of uh, country and to speak with them in, in, inside the competition, in a training camp, to understand, to understand, uh, to let them understand about Israel. And uh, also I give a lot of uh, exploration talk and uh, 
let people to understand the complicity and also how I deal with my situation and uh, and what you've been to, through. Yeah. Yeah. What I've been well, through. well, it's interesting because you know you would think that somebody who goes through such a traumatic experience might not necessarily be, be the biggest fan of the state of Israel, but you have now been dedicating your life to kind of changing the world image about this country. Um, how how did that happen? How how did you become aware that this was something that you wanted to be doing? Um. Actually, I don't know. I, 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 it's just something for me, from inside, and tell you, you have to do that. You have to, to go, to stand up, to fight on Israel, because before I do it in the army, defend our, our border, and now I get the opportunity to do it in other, mm -hmm. in other uh, ways. So it's, for me, it's kind of a present to, to keep doing what I used to, to do before. Absolutely. And it's so necessary. It's so essential. Uh, Chia, you're really a hero. You were a hero both on the battlefield and you're a hero in the court of public opinion. It's so important. Today you have people uh, all over the world preaching hatred against Israel and the Jewish people and Zionism in schools, uh, in, in Riverdale uh, School, uh, the Riverdale Country Day School in Westchester, New York. You have teachers who are screaming at students, saying that Israelis are all terrorists and that uh, Zionism is uh, a form of racism. Uh, you have uh, the Beacon School in New York, where they had a moment of silence only for the dead of uh, Gaza, but not ever for uh, Israelis who have been uh, killed. On colleges and university campuses, I can't even come and make a speech, and I'm a very moderate supporter of the two-state solution and end of the settlements and occupations. Uh, within security for Israel, and I get booed and called a Zio fascist, and people are just not willing to uh, listen to the case for uh, Israel. So you and I have that in common. I wrote the case for Israel. You are making the case for Israel, and we need young people and people who have really experienced what you've experienced to make the case. So I hope when you come to America, we can meet, and maybe we can be on a platform together at a university campus in which you can tell your story. I, that's, it was my pleasure. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing opportunity. Yeah. Now, now Taylor here, um, she's actually recently lodged, launched a page on Facebook, mm -hmm. and she is also uh, a pro-Israel advocate, uh, advocate for the Jewish people. Let's take a look at her page first before we discuss this. Why? Why do these people have a lack of basic resources? After so much money that they're given, why don't they have a stable and functioning society? The answer is Hamas. When you start to care about Gazans only when the Gazans have pictures of dead babies on the cover of the news, what you're doing is giving Hamas a reason to kill more children. I'm years old, I'm a proud Israel Zionist Arab Muslim. I came from a Gazan father, a Palestinian father who grew up in Gaza. And I still remember how my father told me what Hamas did when they got the authority, how they killed children only because they support human rights and only because they want peace. It's so much harder to build a stable society than to just sh throw people at a fence and send them with weapons to kill themselves. But that's what you are doing. New York Times, CNN, European Union. You are incentivizing victimhood. You are killing Gazan people. Why did you say that you consider Israel's army one of the most moral ones in the world? A lot of people who think they understand Israel probably will never visit Israel or meet an Israeli or a former IDF soldier in their life. And it's just amazing to see how effective it can be when you meet these people face to face and they can ask you questions. Wow, wow, that is fantastic. Please send me a link to that and I will circulate it on all of my lists. It's a terrific, terrific piece of work. And you're so absolutely right that uh, I've said this before. Every Gaza civilian who was killed accidentally by an Israeli bullet, the legally and morally the responsibility is with Hamas, who sent them to the front using what you and I both call the dead baby strategy, knowing full well that the CNN, the Times, uh, will carry pictures of the dead babies without explanations that it was Hamas who paid parents money to use their children as, as martyrs and making that message and sending it out and having a phenomenal young woman like you uh, on the Facebook page will have an enormous impact. So uh, you too, when you come to America, uh, let's work together and let's go on college campuses and let's tell them the truth, emet, veritas. Uh, the truth is what we want. We don't want propaganda. We want just the truth because the truth is the best support for Israel. So Taylor, why don't you tell us a little bit about what makes your page different, what you've been 
trying to accomplish and kind of what the struggles you've been facing um, have been so far in, in kind of establishing the page that you've established here? So, like you guys mentioned, Achia and I both have taken part in the Argo Fellowship Program. And on my time in the Argo Program, we do a trip to the United States where we met actually with a panel of young Jewish organizations like J Street, Jewish Voice for Peace, if not now. Um, but we also met with APAC. And I felt like on both ends, there's a oversimplification of the conflict that makes it very difficult to engage in dialogue. Whether people are pro-Israel or anti-Israel, it's being oversimplified on both sides. And I felt that as someone who's not affiliated with an organization and not affiliated with the government of Israel, as I could have obviously went through the path of the yeah. Ministry of Foreign Affairs, I felt that social media is out there for me to use to speak to people in the most honest human way. And with doing that, I think it's also important not to ignore the nuances and not just present the sound bites that make each side one-sided, because right. I believe in the Israeli side of the story, and I think that it has some flaws we also have to own up to. But you mentioned the dirtiest word in today's dialogue, uh, nuance. Mm -hmm. uh, no one wants nuance. Everybody wants to pick sides. And if you pick the side of Israel, then you must say that Israel is without fault and without flaw. And if you pick the side of Hamas, you have to say that Hamas is without a uh, flaw. Uh, Americans and university students and professors, too many of them, simply don't want nuance. They don't want to hear an account that gives both sides and that is willing to criticize both sides. I see that now in the work I'm doing on civil liberties in the United States. People don't want civil liberties. They want civil liberties for me, but not for thee. And here they want you to put on a Facebook page that presents one side of the issue. And if you don't do that, you're going to have a hard time getting an audience. But you and I share a commitment to nuance, a commitment to calibration, a commitment to criticism of all sides. Now, I don't mean to suggest that both sides deserve equal uh, criticism. I don't support what President Trump did when he said that the neo-Nazis and, and the people who oppose them uh, have equally good people on both sides. I don't believe that for a second. I believe that Israel's morality is much, much higher than that of Hamas, but it makes mistakes and it can do better. And I think what the message you're sending is so powerful and so important. Uh, I'm curious why you included Jewish Voice for Peace among the people you spoke to. I, every other organization I understand, but Jewish Voice for Peace has really become a hate group. Um, it's not particularly Jewish. It doesn't like peace. And fortunately, it doesn't have much of a voice. But I'm curious, why did you pick that organization, which is completely anti-Zionist, supports BDS, supports supports the end of Israel. Why did you feel it necessary to speak to that group? Our program actually really likes to expose us to all the different shades of pro-Israel advocacy, including the ones that we highly disagree with, to prepare us for um, going out there and defending Israel. I think it's something that I actually encourage a lot of pro-Israel students and people to do is follow those pages and not to surround yourself with the people you agree with. I learn a lot more from the pages that I that I consider my enemies. I actually started this page as a response to Jewish Voice for Peace blocking me from their page. I made a video called Thank You for Blocking Me to Jewish Voice for Peace because the beauty of the internet is that they can block me, but they can't block me from making my own page and defending what my truth is. So I thank them again, if any of them are listening to this. Uh, it's created a situation where I actually am being a lot more proactive than I was when I was just commenting on their posts and they didn't like me. So. <laughs> Have you considered running for the Knesset? Wow, uh, the two of you in the Knesset would be fantastic. Uh, um, I'm not saying prime minister yet, but uh, you know that may be in your future. Uh, you two are both so fantastic. You have given me such a sense of optimism about the future of Israel, the future of Israeli-American relations. You really, really made me uh, feel good. So I, I really thank you. This is a day and age where there aren't that many uh, things said that I so completely agree with, but I am on your side 110%. Well, absolutely, and I think that I, I'd obviously like to discuss kind of how the two of you mm -hmm. met each other as well in your story, because uh, they are a couple, Professor Dershowitz, <laughs> so a power couple. Great. Um, but but I you know I think something that is important here to keep in mind is the fact that we see these pages, but they always seem to be garnering attention from the same exact exact groups. Uh, you know if you're pro-Israel, then the people who are you know following your page are also pro-Israel. And the point here is to kind of grab the attention of those who may not necessarily uh, see things the way that you see them. So that is 
definitely a struggle that I think we could discuss a lot more here when it comes to just social media presence as a whole. But first, why don't we have the two of you tell Professor Dershowitz your story a little bit in terms of how you met? So, so <laughs> go for it. Um, so, like I said, I was I'm an alumni of the Argo program. Achia is a current fellow in the Argo program, and they sent an email asking for an alumni to come volunteer to help Achia ten hours a week, and I signed up. I actually was in the states um, in the middle of my process to apply to law schools in the United States, and I said, okay. I think I'm, I'm going to write you a letter of recommendation. <laughs> Tell me which law schools you're applying to. Wow. <laughs> wow. My dad is going to be very happy to hear this. <laughs> but I uh, was in the process of that. I came back to Israel and I said I'm going to help Achia. And through helping him tell his story, I realized that you shouldn't be afraid to defend your truth and you should put yourself out there and fight for what you believe in like he does. And together we just kind of, through that process, we kind of fell in love. And that sounds funny, but that's just the truth since the beginning of the year we've been together. Ever since. That's not funny. That's a great story. <laughs> what a great story. Thank you. You know, it also shows that if you support Israel, you can find true love. So <laughs> that's true. Win. I will say that something that we learned also is that I'm a secular American Jew, and he came from a religious background in the settlements. And I think showing the diversity of the pro-Israel side is important as well. We disagree on things, but we, at the end of the day, we have the same values and the same moral compass that I really want to share with American Jewry because I feel like young Jewish people are claiming the right to criticize Israel because there aren't enough pro-Israel, real pro-Israel people criticizing Israel the way it should be criticized. So Interesting. Now, yeah. now I understand that you two are also going to be working together, right? You're going to be, I mean, you already have your page established, mm -hmm. but you're launching something down yeah, the we're line? Gonna, yeah, we're starting to do uh, videos <laughs> together against Achia's will. No, I'm kidding, but <laughs> we're getting, we're getting it. sometimes for that. Uh, yeah, when no, he finishes school shopping, soon. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, everybody. I can is be watching. helpful if I can be helpful in any way. Let me know. I think you are the future, and it's so important to encourage what you're doing. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks for your time, Professor Dershowitz. And I'd also like to thank Taylor Amrani and Achia Klein. Now, if you would like Professor Dershowitz to answer your questions, go to our Facebook page and submit them. We'll see you again next week.